Hello and uh, welcome back. We are looking at uh, lecture 1.2 here, arthropod structure and function. And this is just um, an overview. Most of you have taken some type of taxonomy or identification course, which really included most taxonomy being based on similar structures already included. The actual structure of most arthropods are the most common. So this will be a really quick lecture. It's more of a review and just to kind of remind you of some of their parts. Uh, towards the end of the lecture, we will address more about their feeding behaviors and mouth parts, those sorts of things, uh, since those are most related to what we're looking at, vectors of disease. So we know that uh, insects do not have an uh, internal skeleton. They have an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is formed primarily of a protein called chitin. Um, there are uh, lots of uh, chitin is believed to be one of the most common proteins found on the planet because it co composes the exoskeleton of insects. Uh, they also have malphigian tubules and an open circulatory system. They do not breathe through their head like we think, you know, like we do or anything. They breathe through small little openings along their abdomen and thorax known as spiracles. Each of the different distinct regions, the head, thorax, and abdomen are the tagmata collectively. And we have the basic structures here, the most important parts. The compound eye, the ocelli here, these ocelli are kind of like fake eyes. Uh, they're a, a simple eye and then the compound eye. We have the antenna, of course, different mouth parts depending on the insect. The forewing and hind wing, not all insects have wings. Uh, the cirrhosis and reproductive organs, of course, these little holes here, these spiracles here along the abdomen and you see some on the thorax. Then we have their segmented legs. The integument or general body cover of insects is that exoskeleton. An exoskeleton is made up of plates known as sclerites. Uh, they are separated by grooves or conjunctiva, and uh, they are deposited by the dermis. The dermis is a single cell layer of epidermal cells, and they, these cells, their responsibility, here you see it is, here the epidermis, is to excrete the chitin that will harden uh, with time. It's a, a glycoprotein and it will harden over time and create this cuticle. Now on the outside of the cuticle is a, a epicuticle. The epicuticle is this waxy like coating and some insects like fleas for example, some people can actually control them in their house. Uh, if they get a flea infestation, they'll actually lay down uh, what's called diatomaceous earth and the diatomaceous earth is it's silica, it's very microscopic glass-like shards that will scratch up the surface and start scratching off this epicuticle and that will allow the escape of fluids and the insect will dehydrate and die. So it's used for flea control, garden pest control, that type of thing. Um, the exoskeleton can vary in thickness, how rigid it is, how much chitin is in it, how much sugar may be present in it, and the plates themselves but that form all of these different sclerites can be uh, continuous or they can um, occur in segments. So here we have um, this simple drawing of the insect surface. If we go down a little bit lower, here's this epidermis, there's a duct moving through here, and some insects will also have this kind of cuticle-like structure uh, that's part of the layer in between the actual cuticle and the epidermis. Other in, uh, external structures include spines, setae, uh, uh, microtrichia, which are cuticles, the hair-like structures that are made out of cuticle, uh, apophyses, and apodemes. And the um, apophyses are spiny infoldings, and the apodemes are rigid-like infoldings. So uh, usually muscles are attached to these areas. You can see here's an apophysis right here. And these structures are used uh, mainly for some type of muscle attachment since insects have no internal skeleton they only have an exoskeleton muscle attachment will be to the exoskeleton so here we have this muscle attachment directly to the exoskeleton um, these joint areas where uh, the um, where there are, are joints or movements that's where some of those infoldings will actually oops sorry about that where some of those infoldings will actually occur and you can see we have muscle attachment here inside the leg same thing over here. 
generally you know, general form of our you know average fly here uh, internal structures external structures not really going to need to know much more than what's on this diagram here and honestly uh, the only places that we're going to go into a little more detail will be in the eye um, in the antenna in the mouth so in the head itself you have the ocelli here uh, right here remember those are the simple eyes and then the compound eyes antenna are sensory organs and they're used primarily for um, of course in sensing the environment around them uh, we use them for in many insects and it's part of the identification process the head itself is a very rigid capsule it's stationary the mouth parts and mandible um, are attached by muscle internally and they're joined to what's called the prothorax uh, uh, through uh, the cervix and then the mouth parts will be movable and the, that muscle attachment is what allows that the foramen magnum is the opening in the posterior of the capsule and this is where uh, the aorta nerves muscle and alimentary canal enter so we can see uh, here we have the back of the head and we have this foramen uh, magnum right here in the center oops once again uh, right here so this is where everything is coming into the head that's going to run it so this is the back here we're looking towards the bottom here mandibular cavities and such here we're on the side in the front the compound eye um, insects have two basic types if they're day insect or night insects we have uh, day vision and night vision uh, if an insect is photopic, it uses what's called apposition for day vision. If it's scotopic, it's going to use superposition for night. Uh, and this all occurs in what are known as the omatidium. So up here, right, we're going to take this. Here's an insect head. Here's the compound eye. And we're going to take a look at just one of these little circles. You see those little circles in there? Those are the omatidium. So we're going to take a cross section of it. We're going to pull it out. We're going to pull it out, and in there are the rhabdoms and the cones and retinular cells and pigment cells. And if we come down here, we have just your basic cross-section of an omatidium. And on the left, we have um, apposition omatidium, and on the right, we have superposition. And you can see with apoposition, the rhabdoms are lined up fairly the same way. They're a little wider apart in superposition. Uh, and the cornea lens is on the top. And then the cone cells are much broader um, on the outside. And this causes when light shines through, it's going to shine directly in. So the insect is going to see more forward. In the night vision here, in superposition for scotopic vision, you can see these, these structures here, these um, stalks are much narrower. They don't have nearly the same amount of shielding pigments. And when the rhabdoms receive light, they bounce it around inside that omatidium, and this gives us a broader field of view. And this is because we need to intensify the light. There's less light at night. So when we think about how um, insects actually see, on the left is what Hollywood thinks they see, and they're looking at each omatidium as an individual lens, where it is truly an individual lens. In the center, each of what looks like a pixelation each of these is the view of an omatidium. Now this would be um, in apposition, so we're looking at day vision. So each one is an individual lens, and that's all it sees is this little square. But because the eye is compound and all of these, um, these little squares are all brought together, they don't see major detail, but they see color, they can see uh, basic outlines or shapes. Basically, insect vision is a lot like a really bad pixelated picture. Humans, we have lots of rods and cones, and we have more data gathering ability than the insect does. Um, but the insect is using it just really to hunt prey. They don't need this really superimposed vision like human vision. That brings us to mouth parts, which are really important parts of the insects. Uh, they have a lot of the same structures. Right? All mouth parts have the same structures, but their morphology or shapes are very different, and this is because the functions of them are very different. So we have two basic forms for vectors, which are your mandibulates and hostulates. So the mandibulates are your chewing insects, and the hostulates are the sucking insects. On the left here, here we have a mandibulate. This is a chewing insect. The mandibles are really broad and strong. They have a lot, they're you know, made out of a lot of chitin, 
and they have um, a lot of strength, like a really big pair of uh, pliers, you could say. Here, the butterfly, there's uh, the proboscis and the butterfly is flexible. They can actually straighten this out. And in some butterflies, it's very, very long. So they tend to feed on nectar in long tube-like flowers. Some butterflies, their proboscis is not nearly as long. So they will have to feed on more open flowers like the milkweed or like a daisy. In the piercing or sucking um, part, we have what's called the labrum up here, the labium, which is right in here, this lighter gray area, and then we have the labial groove, and that is oftentimes where the proboscis is going to lie. And uh, for the piercing and sucking insects, uh, their proboscis is inside uh, of the labrum, and it will uh, be pushed forward. Over here on the right is what is called a chewing or lapping insect. Now these guys don't pierce anything. Um, their uh, uh, mandible is much further up and their tongue, they have this tongue-like structure that can be very long and it has, um, has like little spikes or think of a serrated edge. It has like a serrated edge so they can, uh, they can lap up and gather, gather things with it so it's kind of sticky. With the sucking and, and, and biting insects, this is where we see most of our vectors because they are uh, blood feeders. So they're going to be penetrate. Uh, this labium will actually penetrate down into the skin. This is the head and mouth parts of a mosquito. And uh, they will also, because their proboscis is so small, they'll actually have to inject some kind of anticoagulant to break down the blood so that when it moves up that really small straw, uh, it, um, it doesn't clot. Their direct contact with the bloodstream is what makes them such fantastic vectors. They, um, are in, they immediately, they kind of probe around the mosquitoes in particular, were actually probe multiple times until they come into contact, uh, direct contact with capillaries. So this is why they are so good at transmitting disease. Antenna are, again, these sensory organs that we tend to use for identification. There are lots of different types of antenna. I'm not going to ask you to um, uh, label um, pictures of antenna that you should have done in your classification courses, um, but there, it's just to kind of give you an idea that there are lots of different types, and we use them in classification in particular. They're very, very um, interesting for classification. They are, as sensory organs, they do things like direct, uh, detect movement, vibrations. Uh, they can detect pheromones from other insects, honeybees. Uh, they release all kinds of different pheromones and chemical signaling as a form of communication between uh, social insects. Uh, arthropod systematics, we just kind of did a whole lecture on this. Um, the, the basic components of biosystematics, uh, identification descriptions, and um, erecting classifications. We talked about the Linnaeus classification system, and again, kingdom, phylum, class order, that sort of thing. Uh, when we talk about different species, sometimes we may come across what's called a cryptic or species complex. Um, when we have two groups of organisms that are similar, but reproductively distinct, Right? So they're, they look like each other, structurally they're very similar, but they're actually two different species, so they can't mate. So reproductively they're distinct from each other, but they're in the same environment. Right? Uh, if they're in a sympatric environment, there may be some uh, reproduction between them. So if they can reproduce, but they're two different species, that would be uh, called uh, sympatric. And this is a, a, a positive form of gene flow. So they, they, we actually start seeing mixing. An example of this could be the uh, European honeybee and the African honeybee here in South Florida. They are two different species, but once the Africanized honeybee made its way into the southern United States, it was able um, to start mating with the European honeybee that we have here in the U.S., and so it was a sympatric type relationship. There was positive gene flow between two different species. If it's an allopatric um, type of relationship or environment, those Africanized honeybees, they might be able to interact and coexist with the European honeybees, but they would not have been able to mate with them. Um, so they uh, would be far away. Now here in Florida, the European honeybee and the African honeybee are cryptic species because we cannot morphologically tell the difference. You cannot look at a honeybee and say, uh, that's, an, that's, a, a, that's an Africanized honeybee or that's a European honeybee. So uh, they're considered cryptic species. 
when you have lots of multiple cryptic species, this now makes up a whole species complex. So over here on the right, these are groups of butterflies. This is a group of butterfly. Um, they all look very, very similar. It's really hard to tell the difference between them. I mean, these two right here, aside from size, um, their banding patterns are so similar, they're hard to tell the difference. So we have eight different species of butterfly here, but there's only four genera and two subfamilies. And when we have multiple cryptic species, this is referred to as a species complex. The genetic differences between these cryptic species are so minor uh, that sometimes they're not even classified separately. The blood feeding uh, insects. Blood feeding is a uh, mechanism known as hematophagy. Hematophagy is where a vertebrate uh, blood is used as a nutrient source. Again, going back to mosquitoes. Mosqui only female mosquitoes are blood sucking insects. Male mosquitoes feed on nectar, but females feed on blood and they only feed on blood when they are gravid, meaning they, ha they are fertilized and they have eggs. And they're feeding, they're using the blood as a high density nutrient source to try and feed the eggs. So this blood is used for egg development, um, for growth and development of nymphs if they have uh, young that are blood feeding as well, and as a primary energy source. Now, one of the problems with vertebrate blood is it's not all encompassing. So our blood can be low in certain vitamins. Vitamin B is one in particular. Uh, we have to eat a lot of foods that contain vitamin B in order to maintain healthy levels. If blood is the only nutrient source, the insect will need some type of symbiont. A symbiont is a bacteria or protist that lives in the gut or in the digestive tract of the uh, insect and will help the insect break down food, just like our own gut flora. We have bacteria in our own uh, gastrointestinal system that, per, that by breaking down certain foods makes some nutrients um, bioavailable, it's called. And so this bioavailability is because uh, we can't uh, take, for example, vitamin K. We can't produce our own vitamin K. We have to extract it from the food we eat, but we're not very good at it. So there are bacteria in our gut or in our gastrointestinal tract that can extract that vitamin K. They actually metabolize the food and release um, vitamin K as an absorbable form for us. So we can actually get that from our own uh, symbionts. Now we store our symbionts in, for the most part in our gastrointestinal tract, but for insects, they're going to store it in very specialized cells called mycetocytes or in specialized tissue called myce uh, mycetomes. So what are the groups of blood feeding insects? The lice, uh, kissing bugs are an important one because they spread Chagas disease. Bed bugs, which don't spread disease but do cause secondary infections and they are a nuisance and they have a major uh, economic impact. Um, we have the fleas. Um, fleas are both uh, animal and human. So in zoonosis, how much money is spent every year on flea control? Think about that. Uh, mosquitoes, of course. Biting flies. Um, so you can see the diptera there. That, that order there is, is, is big. Uh, the midges, and then ticks and mites, which fall um, under arthropods as arachnids, not insects. The theraptera we talked about in the last, uh, in another lecture, remember we have the chewing and sucking lice. Uh, the primary order, theraptera, consists of those Malophaga and Anoplura. In Malophaga, those are your chewing lice, and they're most common in birds. We see lots of chewing lice in birds. In the top right here, you can see this is a hen that is infected with red lice, they're called, and uh, this is a pretty heavy infestation. See it a lot in uh, poultry farms where the chickens are held, uh, you know, thousands of them in a single barn when they're held in very closed quarters. They feed on sebum, dead skin, uh, feathers, and eventually they'll get through the skin and start uh, blood sucking. Then there's the dog louse. Uh, if lice attack a dog, there is a species of dog louse and it will transmit tapeworm. Um, so this lice will consume tapeworm eggs if they're near the anus of a dog that has tapeworm because the, the dogs pass tapeworm eggs in their feces. If they do this and they start um, biting humans, they transmit over to humans, they can actually cause a tapeworm infection in humans. Uh, and these uh, chewing lice can cause a lot of blood loss, secondary infections because of the itching and in, uh, immune and infl inflammatory reactions. Most of the time, particularly on birds, these lice are around all the time. 
they're just not in huge numbers. But they can transfer from host to host, and they can do this through direct contact. They can do this um, also through what's known as foracy. So in foracy, the insect is going to hop onto another insect and hitch a ride. So these lice are really, really tiny. I mean, look at how small they are. They could grab onto a fly or um, a mosquito or some other insect and hang on to that insect until it takes them to a no host. That would occur in an area where there's heavy infestations and other insects are available. With the sucking lice, um, they have retracting mouth parts. So when they're not piercing the skin and suctioning, uh, suctioning blood out of, out of the host, that mouth part is going, that, that piercing mouth part is going to be retracted. Uh, the sucking lice are exclusive to mammals, so we don't see these on birds. Right? Birds are avians. Uh, they are major, major problems in uh, uh, pests, in agricultural, in the uh, farming industry, and of course uh, in human lice, right, head lice. So we have uh, hog lice. You can see here is um, a pig, right? So we have a swine over here that's infected with lice. It's a lot of bloodletting going on. Here we have cattle, so we have a um, ox louse. This is a, uh, looks like a horse that's also lice infected, right? We have the Linnaeus names over here. Uh, human specific lice, we have the uh, head and body lice right here. Here's more head lice. And then uh, we have the pubic lice down here, the Theros pubis, so pubic lice. The hemiptera we're going to spend a little bit of time on in another lecture. The hemiptera include the kissing bugs. And in this particular uh, uh, subfamily, we're looking at the triatomines. And these are important because they actually transmit Chagas disease. You can see here well, the, what these guys do is they visit the host at night. They're attracted to CO2. So they oftentimes are around the mouth here. They'll be around the mouth and they will inject the proboscis. I'm, I'll show you a video of them feeding. They will inject, uh, they will uh, stick their proboscis into the skin pretty deep and uh, create a blood meal. As this insect creates this blood meal, it will expand. Its gut area will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it expands, it causes um, defecation to occur. So any feces that was in the insect prior to the, from the last blood meal will be expelled by the pressure of the next blood meal. This feces lands onto the, on the skin. Now, because these guys have such a big, look at the size of this guy. He's big. Um, so uh, because of the size of these insects, uh, that piercing that they do and how deep it is, uh, is really uh, painful. And the host will scratch or swat at it or scratch. And when they do so, they end up wiping the feces into the cut. And that will, and that will introduce the um, trypanosome. So Chagas disease is a disease caused by a pathogen that is related to African sleeping sickness. They're both caused uh, by trypanosomes. And so trypanosome will be transmitted through feces into that wound, again introduced into the bloodstream, and the patient, the, the host can then contract from triatomines, uh, they can contract Chagas disease. That's in South America. And it's only in South America because that's where we have the triatomines. We do have them here in southern United States, including Florida. Um, but in the African continent, we have the exact same type of transmission, but instead of it being through the triatomine bug, it's actually through the tsetse fly. And the tsetse fly transmits a different version of trypanosome, uh, which it causes what's known as African sleeping sickness. Uh, bed bugs also fall under the hemiptera. They don't cause any disease, and they're most commonly found on birds and mammals. They are ectoparasites, uh, quite a nuisance down here. We had a, a large bed bug outbreak in the United States a couple of years ago, and it cost millions and millions of dollars to hotels and um, lots of other places. And you can see here how bed bugs are, are infesting. And they are just everywhere now. They're all over the place. Uh, Siphonoptera are the fleas. Think siphon. These are blood-sucking um, uh, uh, insects. The adults will emerge from small cocoon-like structures in response to host actions. Uh, there's a couple of others. They are jumpers, so fleas don't 
they're wingless, right? They're, they're not flying, but they jump. They have these really incredibly strong back legs right here, and they can jump quite a distance. They can transmit things like plague, typhus, tularemia, tungiasis, uh, which is a burrowing flea. That's what's going on down here. It burrows. It's sometimes referred to a uh, sand flea. It'll burrow into the skin and create this little black hole right here. That black hole is for oxygen. So the, the larvae can breathe. The diptera are the biting flies. They have uh, what are called reduced hind, uh, hind wings, halteres. Uh, there are three different suborders, the mosquitoes, the stable flies, and horse flies. Uh, those that are medically important are the sand flies, uh, moth flies, and black flies as well. So mosquitoes are, of course, the biggest, uh, the biggest part of uh, vector diseases. They are the females are blood fading when gravid. They transmit viral diseases, bacterial diseases, uh, proto they, uh, some protozoan diseases, and helminthic or worm diseases. They are the most common disease vector uh, worldwide and they are found worldwide. Uh, just ask anyone in Alaska in the summertime. They can transmit uh, multitudes of different diseases, particularly viruses. They're really good at transmitting viruses. Um, they, some people do have um, allergic type reactions to the anticoagulants that they inject into the skin, uh, which can cause systemic and localized um, allergic reactions. Uh, you can see down here, we, this is a sand fly down here, uh, and of course how malaria affects uh, different parts of the human body. This is blue tongue, blue tongue is in sheep, which is a big problem in Europe agriculturally uh, and uh, economically. Um, other diptera that are important are the shorthorned flies uh, and the uh, tabanidaes. The tabanidaes are horse flies, deer flies. Uh, they have long legs and uh, they transmit uh, trypanosome diseases, tularemia, bacterial diseases, and the filarial worm that causes a condition known as loa loa, which is what we have up here. Uh, the snipe flies can mechanically transmit some pathogens, but they're really more of what's considered a nuisance. This is a snipe fly down here. This is a deer fly here, and deer flies, there's another uh, subspecies of deer fly that has a very triangular rigid wing. Uh, we have those here in central Florida. They're pretty nasty. Other diptera are your stable flies, um, and they don't really transmit any diseases, but they are um, they can uh, really be an annoyance and pest, and of course, uh, there's always mechanical transmission. This right here is the tsetse fly, and you can see it's had a blood meal. And this fluid right here, the tsetse fly is very much like the triatamine bug. As it consumes its blood meal, this fluid will be released out of it because of due to pressure. Um, African sleeping sickness and another disease that has uh, caused a stunt in economic development, particularly in the African continent, is a disease known as Nagana. The arachnids, so ticks, we know ticks are up there with mosquitoes. I would say after mosquitoes, ticks are probably one of the organisms that really spread a lot of disease. Uh, Lyme's disease, Babesiosis, uh, uh, lots of blood loss, tularemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So they transmit lots of different forms of pathogens. This is, uh, I believe, Babesia, Babesiosis. We're going to do some uh, blood cell comparisons uh, because this looks a lot like malaria, but it's actually not. And so we're going to, it's one of the projects we're going to do in class. Other arachnids include the mites. Mites are um, dust mites, uh, tapeworm, um, harvest mites. These guys cause skin rashes. Uh, the three important families are the... Um, uh, 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 Demosisidae, the Trombiculidae, and the Astigmata. Uh, uh, these guys here, the, the trombies cause uh, chiggers. Uh, they are, I'm sorry, they consist of the chiggers and harvest mites, red bugs. They cause a lot of skin irritations and rashes. We have down here uh, the dust mite, which is a big problem for allergies, a lot of allergic reactions. They can transmit tapeworm. Again, those tapeworm eggs are really, really tiny, so they can attach to stuff and be transmitted pretty easily. Now here, this last one here is the Varroa mite. And the Varroa mite is what you see right here on this honeybee. And Varroa mites have caused 
millions and millions and millions of dollars to the honeybee industry. And the honeybee industry is a lot bigger than most people think. Um, and uh, uh, they are our big pollinators. And these varroa mites have been thought to have a play a role in colony collapse disorder and other diseases that are being transmitted or spread from honeybee colony to honeybee colony. And this loss of honeybees is causing a real problem for uh, pollination of many of the foods that we eat. So we need to make sure that we protect these honeybees. So those are, that's an overview of some of the organisms that we missed in uh, uh, lectures 1-5 one, one and 6. Uh, these guys were a little more medically important, a little more relevant to what we're going to be looking at in the rest of the term. So you want to be familiar with these guys, some of the different families um, and common names, a few of the diseases that they may transmit, and some of the different pictures. You want to be able to recognize those. Um, so we will uh, finish this up. This is the end of this unit here. We will have uh, exam one, and then we'll move into the flies. So see you in class.